Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think I, I should preface by saying one of the things that has been so striking about doing this research and then seeing it. You know, when you're inside of something, you don't exactly see what it is. And then you assemble it, and you're starting to see it. And then when it's, it's like a production. You have a production of a play, and finally you see a play, and you're ready to figure out what's next. Um, I hope this will answer, or at least address Doug's question. Um, one of the things that became really clear after the fact was that everything that has happened that I would say is, is hostile or, or not working for the playwright in the American theater happened, um, it, it, it's the result of um, actually good intentions. Do you know, the, the perfect example, of course, is um, literary management offices. They were, they were developed as a way to create access for playwrights and to be able to read scripts as they come in and to be able to have someone whose sole job or some people whose sole job was to welcome playwrights into the theaters. Over time, they became buffers between playwrights and the theaters rather than conduits for playwrights. Nobody set out to create barriers between playwrights and the theaters. Um, and, you know, and you'll never meet an artistic director who um, doesn't honestly love Playwrights, you know, I mean, any artistic director in this country could say what Molly said last night about their relationship to the playwright. In some cases, like Molly's, you have someone who's really put her money where her mouth is and is really investigating her own practices. So, what the playwrights, I'm not sure that the playwrights did anything, um, but I do think there's a way in which, over time, you have ceded authority over your own lives to the people who select plays, started to take it for granted that playwrights, oh, playwrights are never hired to run theaters, so playwrights can never run theaters. Um, I'm just a writer. Uh, we have no collective power. You know, that, those kinds of things that happen that I think are partly from, um, I don't know if they're from timidity, but I think they're certainly from isolation. You know, at New Drama, it's one of the things that's really striking at my office is right across the street from our, right across the hall from our writing studio. And um, inevitably, uh, I'll hear somebody in the writing studio and I'll go in to make sure that the air conditioning's on or the heat's on or the lights are good. And the playwrights always sit in the dark. <laughs> you are mole people <laughs> who sit in the light of your screens. And I mean, it is, it is inevitable. There is no playwright in, of the 50 playwrights currently in New Drummers who walks in the room and turns on the lights. <laughs> And I think that there is a, I mean, it's a kind of lame metaphor, but I do think that there's a kind of, um, a kind of isolation that's bred from the fact that the bulk of your work happens alone, and then there's this horrible and increasingly long period of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting to hear that you start to, you, you know, playwrights over time have become more alienated, and then you start to swallow your own alienation in a way. And rather than think, that there are other ways, you think, well, this is the way it is. I, I mean, yeah. so, so I, don't, I don't think it's anything that the playwrights have done, but I do think it's, there are questions that need to be asked at every point, and questions are terrifying, especially when you feel you don't have power. Like, why does the nonprofit theater rely on royalties? The for-profit theater that sells bullloads of tickets when things go well is natural for royalties. But a subsidized theater, why have we never subsidized the playwrights? Why have we not asked that question? And now we can see, well, 3% of your income comes from the foundational place that your income is supposed to come. Okay, that's an old practice. It doesn't really work. So partly maybe playwrights should, should be asking better questions, should be working together more, you know. Yeah. So becoming more assertive or seating less. Yeah, and I think part of it is you, you've lost a lot. Do you know? It's not like your situation can get any worse. <laughs> you know? I mean, and that, that doesn't just go for playwrights. I mean, it, it goes for the theaters, too. We're all in the shits, you know? The, the American theater, I mean, theaters are folding every week. 
you know? Fear is rampant. The money is not there. We have, and yet, as Molly pointed out, there are 950, 1,950 theaters in this country with budgets of over $75,000. What do you do? There are 4,000 universities. What a great moment when she said that. So there's lots of opportunity, and there is abundance. It's just we tend to see, right? you know, your playwrights who live in conflict. And so we see the, the But who would like to ask Todd a question? Say, will you say your names to I mean, Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Roberta DeLois, and um, I've seen Todd speak before, and he's really awesome. So thank you, Todd. Thank you, Roberta. Um, uh, this is a little bit complicated, but you mentioned HowlRound, which I follow pretty well as well. And if you remember um, weeks ago, months ago, Matt Smart wrote a very interesting column, if you haven't read it, about basically playwrights are in the shits because we're lazy and we don't work hard. And that's, that's really capsulating a long, interesting thing. Um, but it made me think, because when I read about emerging playwrights that are kind of up the ladder for me, like the Tory Hall and a few others, they all talk about how they apply for every opportunity, how they, you know, not just networking and you go to things and, and shake hands and meet people, but they see an opportunity that might be good for a play and they hone it. They work, 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 aside from the work of playwriting. So I'm wondering if you, even this long question, if you have any comments about like working hard versus not working hard versus like what, I do this all the time, sorry. Um, like where that sits for you in terms of what you see in the world of playwrights. Brian, excuse me, work did, did everybody hear the question? At its essence, are writers lazy? <laughs> Right. Opportunity no, I was being could flipped. be because we're in this bitter place of this yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think uh, it's a great question. And as, um, as I recall Matt's piece, it was really about, it, maybe I'm misremembering, but I think it was more about laziness within the work itself, not in terms of applying for opportunities right, 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 and things right. like that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and I don't, I, that is the sort of thing that I would never generalize about, you know. I, I know playwrights that kick themselves up and down the stairs um, about everything, and sometimes it's productive and sometimes it's not. People work really hard. Uh, every playwright I know works really hard. Um, uh, but I, I, I would turn that question a little bit to this notion of um, what does it mean to be a writer in a collaborative art? Um, you know, and it seems to me that um, playwrights live in a kind of, I, I think of it as a kind of schizophrenia that I don't, I'm a novelist and an essayist and I, I don't really understand the desire to write something and then give it to other people to fuck it up. <laughs> I don't really understand, I mean, I'm, I guess I should because I'm a Gemini and I work as an artistic director and I also work as a writer, but to do that with the same material um, seems to me strange. Um, however, the fact that you do means that at a certain point in your process, you enter into a really deeply collaborative situation. Now, you are actually, um, because you're in the theater, you are always under the umbrella of that collaborative situation. And what we heard in this uh, research again and again from artistic directors is that playwrights are sending plays that are not finished, that they are encouraged to do that by their teachers. And partly it's the unintended consequence of the fact that you know that every theater is going to want you to rewrite your play, even if it is finished anyway. Um, and that there, so that there's a sense of, and then there's like defensiveness, and then there's who do you listen to. And of course, it's a terrible situation because everybody, including the box office person and the marketing intern is telling you what to do with your play, but there are people that need to tell you. Producers actually have a point of view, and the, you know, that relationship between producer and playwright is potentially a fantastic one, and, a, and it is the heart of, our, of, our, of the theater. So um, I guess th this is all to say, what is the actual work? And you know, who dictates it. And yes, you may work alone very hard. You may rewrite and revise and rewrite and revise, and then come to a point where it's like, I don't accept the collaboration. 
or you may not work hard enough and then put it out to collaborate. Do you know what I mean? And I think every playwright knows that in his or her own heart uh, to the extent that you've been trained in the discipline of rewriting or that you've discovered what it means to actually throw something away and start over and really get at the essence and that you're asking the right questions. Um, so I don't know how to generalize that about that, but I do think that uh, hard work is better than less hard work. <laughs> yeah. And some of that is related to, to the points that Richard Nelson made in his speech four or five years ago, where the, which goes back to your, the first question I asked, that the theater uh, world is more uh, tended to treat us like children and we've allowed ourselves to be treated right. like children, right? So, yeah. yes? Um, Lydian Sullivan, uh, I'm one of those uh, playwright bloggers you mentioned. I know. I, I think it'd be interesting. Could you say where you're from to when you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm from here, Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, yeah, I blog for Hal and I'm the Mercury Amphitheater. And, um, I'm interested to hear what feels like a slightly quiet call to arms to us to take over theaters. Uh, to <laughs> oh, is that quiet? <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't saying, you know, man about it. Um, you know, I have just started to consider myself whether there's a path for me to artistic directorship of a theater. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm interested to know if you see that path. You know, how, it, it feels a little bit like applying to be a brain surgeon, and I realize it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't have a degree in brain surgery. I, I've been a playwright, and I think a lot and write a lot very publicly about theater, but is that, yeah. you know, so where's the path from there to, you know, change news did, did everybody hear the question? No. <coughs> yes? Okay. No. 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 Um, what, is there a path, and if so, uh, could he describe it from being a playwright to perhaps moving into a position as or similar to artistic director? Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, Gwydion, I want to back off your question a little bit. I think um, because implied in the way you framed it is a sense that artistic directorships are jobs that you apply for in theaters that are established already. I think, um, and it gets at something that I, I found troubling in the research of this book, and I'm going to come back to this notion of leadership, um, which is that despite the fact that Almost every playwright we talked to in co group conversations had lots of great stories to tell about theaters they had effectively collaborated with that did a good job by them, where they worked lovingly with their, their mates. Um, when it came time for critiquing the theater, what everybody was really doing was critiquing institutional theaters of a certain size. Um, so the first thing that I would say in response to this is, um, and because you're asking, uh, I think, my opinion, and I don't know that there's a path out there, or that certainly I have the wisdom to um, uh, detail that path, but I would say, let go of the notion that the institutional theater is the theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want, I mean, the truth is, Moliere never did apply for a job at the head of the theater. <laughs> Do you know? Yeah. He didn't. Che did. Che is also a director who's been an administrator in the theaters and, and that sort of thing. Um, theaters, boards of directors, managing directors, they tend still to choose um, directors to run theaters. They're gregarious. They're used to working, bringing people together in certain ways. It's the way it's done. I'd say let that go. I mean, again, I think, I, you know, in my other, um, my current project has very little to do actually with playwriting. It's about founding, collecting founding visions of American theaters from the basically the 20th century, uh, in the words of the people who founded them, and um, it's very inspiring. And um, you know, the thing is that theaters are always founded and changes are made in our field um, by not by uh, moving into the structures that exist, but finding other structures. I teach this class up at Yale to the managers in the School of Drama, and the theaters that are most exciting to them are theaters like 13P, that is a group of playwrights coming together, or Pig Iron, which is an ensemble that also, you know, devises their own work. And this to me, and also theaters in their own community, and 
children's theaters and, and that kind of thing. So this suggests to me that there's a hunger out there, and I think it's happening. I think uh, one of the reasons that the numbers of theaters is so high is because a lot of theaters are currently being founded, despite the fact that everybody is being told it's too late, you can't found yeah. theaters anymore, there's no money. So I would just say that's the, the path is carve out your own path. It is a job market, you know, those things lead to each other, but, um, and it's opening up a little bit, but I would say as much as you can suspend that notion. Yes, in, in the back. Yeah, um, um, this is going to be quite contradictory. Say your name again, please. Uh, Mabaka Johannes of Zara. Yes. Um, so basically, do you think a lot of the issues that you address, as far as it relates to the dire straits that we as playwrights find ourselves in, how much of that is related to the the embarrassment that we have as, you know, making what we do a, a commodity. You know, like it's kind of, sometimes it's like, you know, I'm an artist, so, you know, the stuff that I'm writing and sitting here working on, I feel kind of embarrassed about, you know, saying that it's for sale, you know, on some level. Um, that being number one. And then number two, I'm very interested in new dramatist and applying because of the fact that it's not so commercially driven you know, as some of these other things. So, have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start at the very beginning. Um, the, this notion, the, I don't know how to really address the first question, though I understand that it's an important one. Um, that sense of your, um, you know, your work is your work. It's personal, it's new, it's lots of things, it's alive, and it's also something that you need to sell, you know, and you're selling it in a marketplace that was originally intended as a kind of nurturing space and is more and more a, a commercial marketplace. Um, so um, I think that's one of the great things about like being part of a guild, being part of a profession where you have people to mentor you and teach you and, you know, to teach you the skills that allow you to agent your own work, to market your work, to um, you know how many rejections it takes before this patch of skin is you know strong enough to take the next one, you know that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's uh, it also in a way goes to Gwydion's question, which is uh, a question of um, you know we live in a profession, especially in the nonprofit art theater in this country, that is still rooted to a certain extent in love of the art, in amateurism. But it has professionalized at an accelerated rate really since the early 60s. And certainly since the days of uh, the actor that was in the White House in the 80s. <laughs> and, um, it, and it has professionalized in such a way that suddenly you are aware that you're not just throwing your art up on the stage of Cafe Chino for a week, you know, with a lot of other poor bohemians who are living in the village in the 60s, you are now trying to get it to the person who will make a decision within a monolithic organization, or it seems to be monolithic and all that kind of thing. So part of it is about professionalism and how do you reassert the love and the, of the art. Um, the other thing is, New Dramatist, I mean, one of the things that it's really easy to be an idealist in a place like New Dramatist is that we opt out of all of that, um, which is a really kind of luxurious and fake position to be in. Because I can sit in New Dramatist and I can say, we live in this ideal world, we give everything away, the playwrights can do whatever they want once they get in, we don't tell them what to do, we have no say over what they do, we don't select them, they're selected outside of us, the staff, um, and everything is a gift and we don't sell anything. And therefore, we are pure, and everybody else is corrupt. <laughs> right? We can say that, that's easy to say, but it's just not true. We're so lucky to be in that position and to be able to make it work, and it's hard to make it work, and it's hard to raise the money and all that kind of stuff. But, um, uh, you know, we're actually, we are permeable to the theater that, that, that it would be easy to call corrupt, which is it's full of lovely people who want to do the right thing. If I could just posit that, I think that's what is becoming the issue, the chasm between, you know, being able to be in a place where you're producing art and, you know, you're getting some sustenance, maybe not monetary, but you're getting some sustenance from that, whether or not, you know, people know you as this guy is a playwright, or this guy is an artist, 
you know, even if he's broke, you know, there's some sort of currency that, that's attached to that. And if, if, if these two things are growing at, uh, at the same rate in different directions, yeah. it becomes an issue for us. I think it's absolutely right, and I think it's really at the heart of um, what is so hard, not just for playwrights, but for everybody who lives in the profession that they love and knows that, you know, it is a split profession. That, you know, it's one of the wonderful things about the, the work that was really, to me, the sort of avant-garde of the 80s, which is community-based work in this country, which is, um, so where is the place that professionalism and the work of the community and the amateur love, where does it come together? You know, how do we, as people who love to make things and be creative together, um, work in a way that also exercises our love of quality, our craft that we develop over time, our mature visions. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, it is really a, a and, you know, I was on a panel in uh, Chicago a few weeks ago with Rock Schulfer, who's for 37 years or so led, brilliantly led Goodman as its executive director. And he was like, you know, this is a really young field. We're finding our way. It's only 50 years old, really, about. And it's kind of true. And so I think part of finding our way is like, can we get back to the love from that place of ultra professionalism? Can we not throw the baby out with the bathwater? Because we have like a whole profession of amazing managers and people who know a lot about audience development and all this kind of stuff. And beautiful buildings. Why shouldn't theater have beautiful buildings? You know? Sure. Yes, sit in the back. And then I'll come up here. Hi, my name is Bill Dunn. I'm from Penn State. I'm here as both a writer and I'm going to be the next president of the Association for Theater and Higher Education. Uh, uh, my question is, and, and uh, part of why, why I'm here is thinking about the leadership I can bring to some of these questions for the next two years in this position um, uh, of what we're doing in the academy in terms of supporting the arts of responding to changes in the culture industries, etc. But I'm particularly interested if you would talk about or if you would be, uh, make some suggestions, how do we need to change our thinking in the academy in order to become part of the solution and not so much a part of the problem, which is what I think we're more a part of the problem than we are of the solution at the moment. Well, I wouldn't presume to know what you're thinking is. Do you know what I mean? So I wouldn't presume to know what the problem with it is, but... Um, well, a quick example. Yeah. One of the things that we do in the academy is we always... The answer to every problem is to start a new degree. Mm. Right? Mm. Try to and then offer it to people and then pump the market full of people with that degree. I mean, that's just... And we just keep doing that over and over and over. And, 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 and I'm not so sure that we need to keep offering degrees in everything that we do and just... Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that particular thing. I mean, I'm not, my mind is spinning around a few things. Um, and one of them is um, defensiveness, which I think it goes both ways. I think the, um, the profession has long been defensive about the academy and vice versa. And so both within our departments and in, within our theaters and you know, across that gulf, there's a lot of like, well, we know what we're doing and they don't. And then we create our little fiefdoms in the departments and we create our little fiefdoms in the theaters. Um, you know, one of the facts that I've come upon that I'm, I'm kind of thrilled to be contemplating in this, um, in looking at these founding visions of theaters, is that Theater Communications Group, which is the National Service Organization for Theater, um, which was founded 50 years ago this year, um, was founded, its an original mission was to create bridges between professional theater, the community theaters, and the university theaters. Okay. And about two years into the life of TCG, the professionals won, <laughs> and they changed the mission. Yeah. So now we are, 50, 48 years later, we are having to rediscover the genetic code and heal the rifts that have created. At the same time, our theater departments are more and more, more than certainly 50 years ago, are populated by theater professionals. There are professional playwrights teaching all over this country, professional directors, 
professional everythings. Um, and so that thing that like when Bob Brewstein went to Yale in 67 and everyone there, no one there had ever actually worked in the theater. <laughs> and he brought, you know, that kind of thing is less, is much more rare um, these days. But I do think the kind of um, defense, so there has to be, Heather McDonald said something beautifully yesterday, which was, um, this was, th this was so easy and natural, I'm paraphrasing her, because we had this time, we had this summer, we had this space here at George Mason, that we are all professionals, the people from First Theater, First Amendment, Heather as a playwright, so it was easy to welcome the dramatist field in. So to find ways to create that um, cross-sector collaboration, I think is really important, and to remember that, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be a history geek, but I will be for this moment. Um, I, I was given some transcripts. If you know the name Mac Lowry, Mac, McNeil Lowry was the first funder of the regional theaters. He ran the Ford Foundation, he was vice president of the Ford Foundation in the uh, early 60s. And he's the one that seeded the growth of Arena Stage, the Guthrie, all the major institutional regional theaters. When Mac uh, Lowry went out on the road to study the field in 1961. Almost ever, I have his transcripts of his that he dictaphoned, you know, when he back in his hotel room at night, um, so that he, they could be recorded. Um, almost everybody he met with ran a university department because that's where the American theater was at that time. And then over the last 50 years, it's migrated to the institutions, and then the individual artists because they can't make a living have gone to the universities, and yet the split is still there. So, heal the rift. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. um, Actually, I'm also from Pennsylvania. My name is Colette Sylvester. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, but I went on to work at the Capitol in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I want you to know, I bought three senators your boss. <laughs> um, they required reading. And then I left the Capitol, and I am actually formed a workshop based on Scotch and Senator Carnegie Mellon. And what we did, we, I had the kids write from scratch. They want to sing a song, they had to write from scratch. They want to be in a play, they had to write from scratch. But one thing that really hindered us when we approached the theater, um, it was like everything is arm's length. They're not allowed to touch anything. And actually, the kids give this wonderful, they call the administrators hors d'oeuvre eaters. Um, they're the hors d'oeuvre eaters. Are they hors d'oeuvre eaters or are they artists? And I said, what are you talking about? They said, do they make the rules or are they part of the art? And, and, and I'm very fortunate to travel with them. And so we began studying the history of theaters, the, the vaudeville circuits. Um, we're actually making require read the original vaudeville circuit. There's a book, uh, The Vaudeville Wars. Um, that's part of the, your book is required reading now. But it so looks, sorry. It looks, I know, I know. I love it. You gotta put the revision in soon. But the thing about it is, uh, it seems to us traveling through from theater to theater, these are high school kids um, traveling from theater to theater. They're actually talking now about creating a circuit of development because we can't participate. So, therefore, if the system isn't working, <coughs> we're going to the dead theaters that have no administrators but a historical society to make a development market that bypasses, God forgive me for saying, the unions, the guilds, everything, yep. that they can develop their work and eat through, through levels of development. They want a statewide award. But it looks like somehow along the way, after Vaudeville died and after the out of towns of the original 1940s and 50s, something broke. It was like the, the cost shot up so far. Uh, an average musical or even drama today begins at 11 million. Uh, the, the goal is to have you know a hundred dollar ticket on Broadway. Somewhere along the line, the the even Broadway, the community thing, the parents brought their kids down. You bought your ticket in the cellar of Walmart or, or Walgreens, and what happens? It's it's like all gone. That it's no longer a community participation. It's like a business. It's not even artistic. It's a business infrastructure broke. And your, your numbers are reflecting that, but no one's even talking about the business of it. And in the end, I came from Pittsburgh where a whole city fell apart, but the steel was gone. It was not so much for me to replace the widget of steel with a play to realize another infrastructure had collapsed. You well, what yes, I, I think I do. Did, did the people in the back hear the question? No, no. no. Okay. You're still, the infrastructure is gone. The infrastructure of development, development, development is gone. And the, the impresarios that united young artists together knew that, you know, Hammers would be great with Rogers. The, the impresarios that created collaboration. And we're trying to figure out 
does anybody else notice this? It, and, and your numbers sort of reflected what we're finding, but we're going through the garbage of Pennsylvania that has been left abandoned. Right. I, I'm sorry, I, I, it wasn't clear to me. Did the people in the back hear the question? No. Do, do you want to? The business yeah. infrastructure somewhere between the 60s and now broke, and, and she's asking him to to uh, address that. Actually, no, <laughs> no. Have you noticed it? no absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think of it in a little bit of a different way because um, because I actually, sadly, don't know about anything but theater. Do you know? And it sounds like you know about a lot that isn't theater. Uh, and I don't even know much about theater, but it goes back to this notion of professionalism too, and it goes back to, the, to me, to the 80s, um, that uh, this, you know, the individual and the institution has always been a struggle in this country. I mean, it's just, it's, it's in our roots. Um, and something really happened in the 80s and that um, it solidified, uh, but at the same time, um, our, the, the, what I, I guess we would call it the sort of grassroots politicization of our country also really started. It was the only response against increased um, institutionalization and business models being the only models. I mean, I remember when listening to Reagan and hearing him use capitalism and democracy interchangeably and being surprised and being like, when did that happen? Um, but at the same time that happened, I mean, I, again, my reference point is the theater. There were people out doing work in communities in what we would now call grassroots or community-based theater that is also old. It really goes back to the early part of the 20th century. But the fact is that, I think, is the only real response. I mean, we've seen it. And, we're, and fortunately, the grassroots has the means, is much more agile and nimble um, and has the technology that the institutions have not yet figured out and the cities have not figured out really how to harness because they're stuck in the dinosaur uh, machinery, do you know? Um, well, I do you know one of the centers, so this, uh, this looks like a thick book, I'm not sure if I want to read it. He happened to be on the Council of the Arts and I said, well, do you understand what's going on? Because I'm not sure. I said, get off the council. <laughs> get the heck off the council. The monkeys have taken over the lab. I said, please try to understand what's going on, or we're not going to be able to fix it. Okay. I've got a question over here on the side, yes. Hi, my name is Ralph Tropp, and I'm from Los Angeles. Um, you, something you said today struck me when I read your book as well, that, that artistic directors say, why do playwrights send us plays that are unfinished? I belong to a writer's group that meets every two weeks, and we hash things out around the kitchen table. And I belong to several not-for-profit theaters that do readings of my plays, but there comes a point where I can do no more with what I've got. I need a director who's got an opening night to head for to show me what his problems are. I need an actress who's memorized the lines to tell me, hey, these things don't fit together. How do we make these artistic directors understand that they're the ones who aren't finishing the play? I've done as much as I can. Yeah. I need a direction. I, I really hear you, Ralph, and I think, um, in a way, Molly and I did not do justice to this moment because we did not say the most important thing, which is um, the most significant change that I perceive and that I feel is happening at this moment is that um, actually the theaters are really getting that. That development and production Nobody is applying for grant money to develop plays anymore without at least phrases about for production. Mm. You know, this is something that I think is the result of years of arguing Richard Nelson, outrageous fortune, feedback from playwrights, feedback from within the theaters themselves. Everybody knows that what you are saying is the truth. And now the question is how do you do it? And what Molly said last night that was a profound, um, is that it's not even about the first production. It's about subsequent productions. You know, the, the amazing National New Play Network, I know Jason Loweth will be here this weekend, you know, that does rolling world premieres so that you get to see at least three productions of your play with totally different companies, totally different theaters, totally different audiences. 
as a way of seeing your plays and seeing what you need to do. So I think that is actually that complaint, which is real and deep and um, uh, earned, is also one of the bright spots right now, which is that development and production are have become really in the last couple of years inextricably linked, linked for this field. Okay. I want to go right behind Ralph, and then I'll come back here. Yes. Yeah. My name is Nick. I'm from Annapolis. Uh, and I was talking with Mr. Kelly, and, and a lot of the things I'm hearing at the at the conference is that there's this call to arms and the separation of the art and the professional world, or something like that. And I'm at a juncture in my life where I'm choosing grad schools and considering whether this is even a viable career for me. Yeah. So I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of. Go <laughs> So nobody knows what it means. I mean, uh, people with business degrees aren't having a great time in the market today either. Do you know what I mean? That you know things are changing so quickly that you know even the short-term future is. You know, look at lawyers and where are the jobs? Um, and the question, the answer is nobody knows where the jobs are. And so the reason it's so personal is. You know, I, I, this, is, this is like as a teacher to a, a potential student, you know, you live your life um, to uh, do your best to anticipate regrets that you will try not to have. You, know, um, you live your life to do the things you feel you need to do so that you don't look back and you say, why the fuck did I do that or not do that? And so whatever is bubbling up in you that you need to do, and maybe it's your practicality, and maybe it's your need to sing, or maybe it's whatever. You know, life is is long, and um, and it's a lot better when you're not burdened by regret. It's also a lot better when you're not burdened by that. So. Mm -hmm. right, we just have time for one or two more questions. Yes, in the back here. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I was, uh, my name is Michael Reed. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. I was, I felt like the big driver behind a lot of this was mentioned in your speech, which is the declining audiences. And you talked about how fewer people are actually going to straight plays. And I, do, I wonder if you have any numbers on how many people actually say they saw a new play in the past year. That would be an interesting number. And do you think there's anything that we can do, do we accept this trend as inevitable? Or is there something we as dramatists can do to try to turn that around? Um, gosh, I wish I had the answer to this. Um, the first one, the, the numbers that come, come out of the NEA um, don't distinguish between new plays and uh, play plays. They distinguish between musicals and non-musicals. Um, the Broadway uh, attendance records are, they distinguish between revivals and plays that are new to Broadway, which you know could be plays that are way old. Um, uh, so I know there, there are no f figures on that. And what to do to turn it around is, is really, I think, impossible to say. Um, you know, uh, everything is changing so fast and in a way so beautifully in terms of um, access to culture and do-it-yourselfism and a connection to creativity. And um, uh, so, you know, I don't really know what to say except that um, 
find where energy is and go to that energy and become part of that energy, do you know? And I don't know if the energy, you know, I don't know what it's like in Kansas City, you say you're from? Yes. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what's happening, you know, at the rep now that Eric Rosen is there. I don't know what's happening, you know, inter, you know in, in other kinds of theater there. I don't know how wedded you are to your community. Um, but I do know that, you know, as I travel, and I've traveled a lot in the last few years, there are places that you just feel the energy. And you feel it in playwriting. And there are places that you don't. And there are places that you feel the energy in acting. And there are places that you don't. And there are places you feel it in, you know, lots of different ways. You know, and so one of the places, New, New Dramatist was looking to partner up with theaters and groups of theaters on this new project that we're doing called Full Stage, at which, which follows a play from, um, from commission really to production with developmental extra time at New Dramatist. And one of the places we found that had great energy was Austin, Texas, that has lots of theaters that are professional theaters that but don't pay at a professional level, with a lot of people who have stayed for a long time and work in each other's work and um, continue to churn out things without any sense of where it's going to go or how it has to go and are making really brilliant and kind of edgy stuff all together and doing their day jobs and living their lives. Um, and uh, it's a fantastic place, you know. Uh, Dwayne's from Seattle. Seattle has had its ups and downs. I don't know whether you'd say it's in the ups now or the downs, you know. Sh you know, Chicago, you know, there are lots of places that have activity and then you just never know where the 